always been a bright group for providing the space. We've been camped here for like a year and a half, and Monday's kicked kick us out. Um, so uh, the first framework we're going to talk about today is Backbone. It was kind of, you know, there were obviously other frameworks before that, um, but it sort of started, I would, I would say, started the craze back in 2011. Um, Rui Jang from Guessware is going to talk about uh, Backbone, sort of give us a sense with all this other, you know, stuff coming down the pipeline, why it's still relevant, what's, you know, what are good use cases, what are bad use cases, and what, what sort of the code looks like. All right. Great, thanks. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm Rui Jang. I'm the interaction designer slash front-end engineer at Yesware. I've been there since the early days. Um, and only recently did we start looking at Backbone. But at the same time, I've created this sort of side project called JustBox, which is a way for you to organize your code snippets online. It has been going on for uh, over a year now, 25,000 users. And so you know, it's going pretty well. Uh, an entire thing is built off of Backbone along with the Rails 3 uh, as the backend. So I'll present a few things that I learned about Backbone in the context of their app, as well as some caveats on what Backbone is good for and what's not. Um, I'll ask you to hold your questions till the end. There's a lot of people here. So, uh, <coughs> Um, in Backbone, there's a general suggestion of passing in the model into the view, 
where it's operating on the, on the model. So then the router is really in charge of taking the URL and translating it into a JavaScript function. I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like later. Um, and then lastly, like all the events in this batch. Um, so you know, a lot of times you're trying to pass events between different views and you have no way of doing it. So traditionally, the way of doing that is to uh, trigger an event, trigger an event on the DOM element that you know to be uh, present in both views. Um, but back home has another way of doing this where you're actually triggering things on an object. And uh, I won't cover that too much, but you can ask me a little, little bit about it afterwards. Uh, back home doesn't care. So I said it's very unopinionated because there are components and bits and pieces you can use all over without actually having to use an entire program as well. So I run apps where I only use the model of collections uh, and the views, for example. I don't really care about how the URL translates to JavaScript functions. So I don't use the router, I don't use the event discussion. You can write something with just views. So, um, you know, if you just have a hard time organizing your view logic, uh, but you don't want to use all like the conventions behind models and collections, you don't have to. So, um, in a sense, this is very good. In another sense, this is very bad because for people who are trying to learn the right way of doing MVC and give them all these different options for picking and choosing, it doesn't really help you. So I'm going to uh, sort of demo my small project that I coded over the last week. Um, and uh, it's a World Cup ranker. Um, I think it's already fitting for the current uh, state of things. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about how it works. So you're given five votes. Oh, let me actually drive this over here. Great, I can't really see what I'm doing anymore. Um, <laughs> So you give them five votes, uh, and each time you vote for a particular country, like I think this is very well. Uh, you know, the vote goes down here, does it? And the uh, sort of one, the number of votes on the thing goes up. Uh, this list is sorted, so if I were to Uh, 
a lot of other developers later on to look at it and be like, okay, these are three attributes that I have on the particular model. So it's just a uh, good habit to develop. <clears throat> the countries collection uh, takes the model, which is the country model, and then a URL, which tells it where on your server you can find its um, browse to your model. Um, and so, you know, by default, uh, Backbone uses a RESTful interface, so listing a country would be a get to countries. Um, getting a particular country would be country slash ID. Uh, so it's everything that you sort of know from Rails uh, resources and RESTful interfaces. Uh, and that's one of the few things it has. Uh, lastly, there's a comparator, um, which, I, which is used to sort the uh, country um, by the number of votes. So you know, when you upvote a particular country and it goes above the number one on the list, uh, that is the work of the comparator. Um, I could have just done the votes without the negative sign, but then it would be sorted the wrong way, so I had to pass it a function. A little bit about mapping requests. Um, there are methods on the collection called fetch, uh, and in doing this, you can make a get request to countries, and uh, the other one which I'll be using is a save um, on a country model. So if the country model already has an ID, then it does an update to the model. If it does not have an ID, then Backbone will assume that it's an entirely new model, and it does a post instead without an ID. Um, this app actually doesn't need a router. I'm just putting it here to show you what it looks like, um, mostly because routers generally have to deal with multiple routes. Um, in this case, there's only one route, uh, which is what I call a home function. Uh, here, what it does is that it instantiates a country's collection uh, it fetches that from the server. <coughs> it also instantiates uh, the app view, which is sort of the overall container for the app uh, And it passes in the country's collection to that. And lastly, uh, this is also a little bit of a backbone connection, is um, you have this uh, attribute called elements, which is what defines the DOM element that you want to stick into the UI. And you call it HTML that using uh, jQuery. So what does the app view look like? Uh, the app view I'm basically breaking this out into just the header as well as the little line of the country votes you have left. Um, I'm going to leave the list of countries as separate. <coughs> so here, the HTML is actually pretty simple. Um, I read this using underscore templates, which is um, similar to ERB. I had to change the uh, sort of deliverers here because they don't play well with that one. But um, it's very similar to ERB. Um, so I have a header here, I have the container for the number of votes left. If it's no votes, it tells you how many votes you have left. If you have no votes left, then it tells you nothing. Uh, or it tells you no votes left. And then I added a container for country rankings, which is a uh, unsorted list. So the app view itself um, is not too long. Uh, there is a convention of backbone to define a template function that you, that you say that um, yeah, you're taking a template from the HTML elements, you are templating it using some data, and then you are uh, returning that element itself. The important function here is the initialize. Oh, let me actually start scrolling here. Can you guys see that? Okay. So, the initialize function, um, there's a number of ways to do this, but uh, actually, decide to call the render uh, method here. Um, the stuff here for listening to collections uh, is what backbone events are for. So in this case, I listen to a collection sync event, uh, which means that when it fetches it from the server, um, it actually calls a render call that. Um, at the same time, there's a change event, which means that if there's an upvote on a particular country, um, it also calls this method, method called sort and render. Now, the reason why sort and render and render are different functions is because um, even if you pass a comparator into a backbone collection, it doesn't do the sorting for you. You're probably supposed to sort on it. Uh, so in this case, it decrements the, num the number of votes in the UI, and then it sorts the collection, and then it calls render. So, So with the render call, uh, what we have is it creates a container. It uh, also creates the country rankings. So what I do is I iterate over the collection of countries, and then I create 
uh, a separate country view for each one of those, and then I append it to the list container that it has in the app. After that, um, as I said, there's very simple methods for dealing with the number of votes left. I'm just using a, a local storage um, key and value. Uh, and yeah, these are just ways to decrement the number of votes uh, that a user has left and to set it in the So, nothing crazy there. So, the country view. Um, so, in that one, there's actually no good guidance about how to break up views. Um, in general, you want to break it up into the smallest possible element that still corresponds to a particular model. Um, so, in this case, uh, I decided to have it be a country model. So, you know, Brazil here would be one single view that corresponds to a country model. Country view template is very simple. It's just a list of elements. It's got the rank, it's got the country flag, it's got the name, and if you could still vote for it, uh, then it's got the uh, button for the menu votes. Country view itself is very similar to what we had before. There is a template function, which just um, renders the UI. Um, what we have here is backbone delegate events. So a lot of times when you're doing jQuery, you want to find an event, you use a global selector, you use something that's uh, actually very computation intensive. Um, backbone has a convention of using delegate events because it forces you to take out a container and bind to elements within that container. Um, and this allows you to write things which are still a lot more popular. So in this case, what I'm saying is that if you click on load up, it calls a function to uh, handle that. Uh, let's see. So the initialize, um, one of the things that actually you need to get passed into this model is the rank, because only the collection outside of the view knows what rank your country is at. Um, okay. As well as the num as well as whatever you use. Uh, and then the rest of it is actually pretty simple. Um, yep, there's this thing for uh, clicking the uh, up button. Um, so if it's not disabled, then it allows you to increment the number of votes. Uh, it saves the model, and this causes a chain reaction on the stack, which causes the entire UI to uh, so what's going on here? So what actually happens here is that the user clicks on the upload button. It triggers the click flow up. Uh, it sets a number of votes on the model. It calls the model.save. Model.save actually calls the server to get back a response. Once the collection changes, uh, the app is actually listening for that particular event, and then calls the sort and render. So that's what sort does the magic of. When you click on something, the number of votes goes up. The user will slow down and then it resorts the collection itself. So, um, as you can see, I didn't have to do any like, you know, explicit re renderings. All I need to do is bind to particular events and uh, have those events trigger the re renderings. Lastly, app.js is very simple. It just works everything off. Uh, it's actually the router, and uh, the backbone history that start actually calls the first route. Um, this is a bit of a close in. So, uh, Backbone has a convention of doing a lot of view and model mixes. So, in this case, if I had an escape HTML function, I could mix it into the Backbone view closet, and it will be available in all the views. So, lastly, what is Backbone good for? Um, it's still where you need to clean up a mess. Um, if you have a lot of JavaScript files, you have no idea what to do with it. It forces you to think about the structure in terms of view and models. Um, if you need to pick and choose components, like in my job, it's where we do a lot of things that don't use backbone, but we like to transition to it. So we can pick and choose particular views and models that we want to use and sort of leave out the rest. Uh, and that's the case with jQuery, although you don't have to. The only uh, hard dependency it has is underscore JS. What's that great for? So there's a lot of rope involved. Um, it gives a lot of rope, so you can use that to do good things, or you can use it to hang yourself. Um, <laughs> You also be you have to be really careful with cleanup. So you know a lot of times I would leave random events like you know tiny MC editor or something else that's a plugin sort of hanging out in the space. You just have to be really careful about cleaning that kind of stuff up. 
Uh, there's no such concept as D-models, so I can have the model with the collection within another model, um, at least not in the vanilla version. And there's no such thing as nested views, so you sort of have to keep track of those yourself. All right, so lastly, uh, there's resources. You can read all about it. Um, there's a particular library called Marionet.js, which is a much more conventional form of backlog, um, and it forces a lot of conventions that are using other uh, frameworks, so you might want to check that out. Um, before I get to questions, so if you want links to the slides, uh, bit.ly slash backlog meetup. Um, and if you want to take a look at my World Cup breaker codes, that's where it's just open source. You can download it. You can go to the Rails app, there's instructions.
little bits of Angular throughout your app very easily. Um, the second thing is simplicity, that if you want to just lock something up, you can use a plain .html file. You don't have to have the build process. You don't have to have it actually run through the engine uh, before it's actually you know, right in the browser. And then the third thing is that by taking this approach, Angular is able to extend the vocabulary of HTML. As you can see in, in this slide, at the bottom I have a My Custom tag, and there's no actual HTML element called My Custom Tag. Uh, when that actually gets pulled into the DOM, you know, uh, the browser doesn't want to do anything, but when Angular goes through and evaluates it, you're able to define some behaviors for that element, how it's displayed, etc. So in this way, through Angular, uh, with what's called directives, you're able to create very powerful, distinctly coupled uh, components that can be reused and shared. And that is uh, really one of the core tenets of uh, Angular. <clears throat> Second thing is that at the data layer, Angular uses plain old JavaScript objects. And this is very different than every other uh, framework. Most frameworks uh, will require that the data that you bind to um, something you know, that's being displayed gets wrapped within another object that has getters and setters. And the reason for that is that the framework has to know when that data has changed. So it uses this sort of wrapper object to notify uh, anything that's on the getter side when something calls a setter. But with Angular, you don't do that. You can take, like I have here, where it's scope guys and you know, just lists a, uh, an array and then populates it directly into um, the document. Angular can work off of plain old JavaScript objects because it uses a process called uh, dirty checking to be able to verify that something has changed. And there are some downsides, for sure, to using dirty checking as opposed to the getter and setter method. Um, but my own personal opinion is that the uh, simplicity that of working with plain old JavaScript objects outweighs uh, the uh, other uh, downsides most of the time, especially if you're dealing with data from uh, back in API and you're loading it into, uh, you're trying to bind it to some elements, it just feels very good to be able to just take that data and stick it directly in there, rather than defining you know, model objects, you know, wrapping those objects, and then you know, setting from there. And then the third major thing that's very uh, different than uh, any of a lot of other frameworks, it's not totally unique, but um, that Angular relies heavily on dependency injection. And so what I mean by that is that you define uh, distinct modules, and then uh, the dependencies between the modules are injected into one another by the framework. In this example here, I define just a utility function called change URL2, and then the, my controller has that injected into it. Uh, so the big benefit here, there's actually two major ones. One is that it enables you, or really encourages you, to create a strong set of standards around the code. They, uh, make them modular, make them you know, smaller, and you know, define what all the dependencies are. And that especially helps if you come from just the jQuery world where uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, if you're just writing jQuery code, it can become kind of a spaghetti mess if you know, it's large enough. And then the second major benefit of this is that it encourages uh, really good test testing. Uh, testing is something that's very difficult on the front-end JavaScript side of things, and Angular makes this a little bit easier uh, by giving you control over the dependency injector. That you know, let, let's say taking you know the my controller here. When I test this, I can test that my controller and like isolate it, and I can pass in something else to change URL to, as opposed to you know what Angular would pass it to. So when you're writing unit tests. You can isolate individual components, and uh, that leads to better testability. There are a lot of different features uh, within Angular because it um, really tries to be a fully, um, you know, a framework that uh, allows you to build both small applications and huge uh, single-page applications as well. And I don't have time to go through all these. I will just mention, you know, for for one item that uh, my friend Matthias uh, Nima, who works on the Angular core team, uh, created the animations library, and that's actually a really good feature. For those of you that um, want to, uh, or are going to be building anything really significant, uh, scope management is a really 
uh, Cisco came within Angular and, and helps out a lot with the management of data um, as opposed to within individual elements. Um, and so that's something that if you are building you know, large applications, you'll definitely want to uh, dive into a little bit more. The other great thing about Angular is that it integrates very well to other frameworks and other libraries. And part of that comes from the dependency injection, um, from the way that the modules are put together. We can override things, you can very easily integrate as well. And so here are some of the things that I use all the time. Uh, so jQuery, uh, jQuery is in pop part of Angular by default. It, it has a jQuery um, uh, uh, mi minimum version of it that it uses. But uh, most of the time, if you're using any jQuery plugins, which most people do, um, building a large application, uh, you can do that very easily integrating jQuery. And the Angular UI project is great. They have a couple of really good projects in there. Uh, the ones I use the most is the UI Bootstrap to be able to uh, integrate with uh, the Bootstrap project. And then also uh, UI Router, which is a really advanced router that allows uh, the basic Angular router doesn't, isn't as uh, good. So the, uh, if you're going to do a lot of advanced routing for like single page applications, uh, the UI router is the way to go. Uh, Angular Fire allows for a real-time backend, um, and that is very useful, as well as uh, Ionic, which is used for mobile frameworks, and is built on top of Angular. So why would you choose Angular over you know, any of these other frameworks? Let me take a step back and first talk about why choose any framework, not even talking about Angular. And I, I found that in these types of discussions, when you, I mean, it's very typical, I've done, I'm sure that many of you guys have done this, where you Google X versus Y, right? right. And Angular versus Ember, backbone versus Ember, whatever. And I feel like a lot of the discussion is off base. They, people like to focus on the wrong things. Like a lot of times the stuff on the right side here, the current features, current performance, current learning curve, th these things aren't unimportant, but my contention is that the things on the left side are much more important. That if you can have a framework that makes your application easy to maintain, easy to build new features, and that you have an engaged community that is constantly innovating, constantly helping you, uh, that will resolve many of the, the issues that might, you might have a feature here or there missing or whatever. Uh, now, the things on the right side are, uh, there's a baseline there for sure, like whatever your requirements are of your given environment, your given application. Uh, there's certainly things that you, know, you have to have to make sure exist there. Uh, but my contention is just that overall, it's more important that your team feels empowered, that they uh, are able to really cover anything. And I, and I feel that that is the case uh, with any of them. Specifically, why I chose Angular, and uh, you know, it, I, I can definitely see the argument for a lot of the other uh, frameworks depending on your environment. So, I, I, when I say go through this, this is not something I think is, is universal necessarily. But for uh, the situation in my organization, and when we go through these, uh, definitely makes sense. So, number one, uh, it's fun to get started. So that means that when you need to do something more on the more advanced side with Angular, there is a learning curve. I mean, uh, just like with Ember doing something advanced, there's a, there's a big learning curve. But when you're doing something similar, simple, when you just are starting out, Angular is actually surprisingly simple and easy. And I think that helps a lot break the barrier with, uh, especially other people in your organization that might be uh, resistant to new technologies and that type of thing. It's very easy to get them going on like, something simple and see some of the magic. And they might not understand everything at first, uh, but they'll, they'll sort of uh, be bought in, and then you can kind of get to the harder stuff from there. For the frame, framework abstractions, I, you know, not everybody likes dependency injection. Uh, some people uh, prefer the more imperative approach. Uh, I think that dependency injection speaks to me and, and my team. Uh, also, the ability to define your own um, kind of domain-specific language within HTML to find your own elements has been, uh, just makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, flexibility, this is one thing that I think is, is very different depending on the team you talk to. Um, you know, when you talk about like, what is idiomatic Angular? What, what are the, the standards that everybody should follow? Uh, I, I really don't 
know what that is because they don't really exist. Uh, whereas you have something like Ember where everything is, is very focused on best practices. Everybody does some things very similarly. On the Angular side, it's more flexible that <clears throat> you have a lot of power, you have a lot of tools for doing things, but they don't really say you have to do things in this way. And so the positive side of that is the flexibility, which I value a lot. Uh, the focus on testing, like I mentioned a lot, I think that uh, Ember in particular is getting better in that area, but really, uh, as far as front end frameworks go, Angular is the uh, best at this. And then, fantastic community. I think that a lot of the different front end frameworks have good communities, but um, just the, the Angular community is very large right now, it is very active. It's uh, the, the members of it I've, I've, I've gotten to know over time, and uh, they just uh, connect, I, that I've connected with, and they're just really great. There are areas for improvement. Um, you know, nothing's perfect, and uh, there's certainly a number of things in Angular that I would like to see change. You know, some of this stuff is actually resolved by third-party libraries in the community, like UI Router, like I mentioned. Uh, I'm actually working on an Angular server-side rendering uh, component, which uh, is not in the core. Um, but for a lot of this other stuff, it actually will be resolved um, with Angular 2.0. So that's the, the good news, is that uh, pretty much most of the criticisms that I'm aware of um, with Angular that either I have or, or other people um, is, uh, you know, they have a plan for resolving that with uh, the Angular 2.0 release. Uh, the downside, just to, to uh, as an FYI, is that they are still working out um, the upgrade path there. Whereas, uh, you know, I think something like Ember does a pretty good job of when each release, you know, not breaking anything, making sure that everybody upgrades uh, without any issue. Uh, Angular sort of has an approach of like future-looking thing. They're trying to implement like the on that cutting edge of like really great new features, and uh, sometimes uh, stuff does break. Uh, so you have to be careful then when, when you're upgrading. So, do we have a comment? Yeah, more than that. Okay, that's good, that's enough. All right. <laughs> All right. So, what I have here is just a plain HTML doc, okay? Uh, and it's just saying, hello world. So what I'm gonna do is try to show um, what Angular can do. Um, so first is just adding a reference for Angular. Uh, and you have to define that an app exists. So uh, I'm going to define that uh, my app exists. And then uh, you have to put the a reference on the body or any, any element really of my app. So this is kind of bootstrapping Angular. Okay, so from now, from now we can start planning things. What we do is uh, first demonstrate data binding, which is one of the core features of Angular. So if I uh, do an input box, um, and what I'm going to do is set the model um, to be a, a set to a value, so like uh, the people. So what I'm saying here is that this input box, what I'm putting in here, Angular is going to save in the scope in something called people. And then I'm going to display it. So uh, there's a. As you can see, as I'm um, typing, uh, Angular uses the directives, which are not only your elements, but also uh, the different attributes to allow for different custom behaviors within uh, the HTML document. So, um, here, person. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to display all the people that are in the list. So, let's see what that does. So, Okay, uh, so you can see the, the, the input box is bound to the list item, and as I kind of flee or whatever else, it gets uh, updated. Let's do something a little further. So I, I mentioned calling out to an external API, so let's do that. Um, there's many different ways to do this, but there's uh, a plugin called the uh, Angular Resource, which is one of the ways to do that, and that's what I'm going to use. So, and all the um, Angular components are split up into small pieces, so you don't have to include all of Angular once you pick and choose those pieces. So I'm going to take the ng resource 
and included here. And then um, I have to define a controller because that's how the resource is going to be applied. So my controller. Um, so what I'm, missing, what I'm doing here is I am defining a resource on a URL. So this is the URL where I'm getting uh, data back from an API. And I'm saving um, the tag service is the reference to that resource. And then the dot query here is just uh, part of the API for the resource. And it basically does just as a get, a very simple get. And uh, like I mentioned, you can bind the data directly to Angular without grabbing or whatever, so I'm sending it directly into the scope into tags. So let's do this. Uh, so I have to define a controller, and then let's do uh, tag and tags. Um, tags is an object, an array of objects, so I have to do tag.name, not just tags. And let's see, yes, okay. So that displays about that, and let's do some sorting. Um, so they have uh, filters that you can apply. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to order by the name value, and true just it defines how it's sorted. But let's actually change this. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm creating a button that uh, changes the sorting alphabetically between ascending and descending. And I know I'm going through this fast, but I don't have that much time. I'll answer questions right afterwards. But basically, I'm setting the sorting so that you click on this button and it changes the sorting. Okay? Uh, and I click on it and it changes. Yay! So you can see that. Um, I mean, like, so obviously, like, I set up some live templates to, like, kind of quickly populate stuff, and I, I, I know about a lot of the directives that are built in, so, like, I can do it quickly, but not that much code, right, to do something that's a little bit sophisticated, uh, and that's what it is all about.
just that's that's the context that I'm coming from to present to you. But what I'm here to present uh, truly is uh, a tool that we have been using uh, called EmberJS. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with it. I've heard lots of buzz about it. But uh, it also is a truly re remarkable community. Uh, so the title of this uh, is All It Takes is a Spark to, well, that says it wrong, but basically the idea is we have been sort of forging and pioneering the future of the internet with Ember.js and using JavaScript as a tool to do that. And uh, the sort of catchphrase that Ember uses is uh, ambitious web apps. And that's, that's what's at the core of uh, what the Ember community is trying to do. We're trying to address large problems and attack them in an aggressive way that is thoughtful and compassionate. Uh, so, what are the big ideas behind the framework itself? Um, so, short answer, uh, follow conventional wisdom that we've learned in the past. Uh, make adaptable variations, uh, you know, nested within that. And then, uh, any of those tools that are nested inside of your JavaScript framework, uh, base, base the uh, variations on your domain and business applications. And that sort of uh, mimics anything that we see in nature that is uh, truly symbiotic and uh, a healthy uh, way of, of doing things. Uh, so, sort of longer answer, uh, Ember provides a host of tools pre-assembled with a set of conventional defaults. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ruby on Rails, and uh, Ember is a direct uh, sort of descendant of uh, Ruby on Rails. And we all know that Ruby on Rails has transformed the way that the internet works and the way that people can get stuff done. It's been a very powerful and useful tool to get things done and build uh, good businesses. Uh, so second part here, um, like I said before, nested inside of configurable elements for creating desktop style client-side JavaScript applications in a web browser. Uh, so that, uh, starting out, Ember uh, has sort of been a tool for building single-page apps. But we all know that there's a lot more to the internet than that. There are a lot of brownfield apps. There are a lot of legacy apps that are doing enterprise-y things. And that's not always compatible with uh, getting stuff done in your business. So why Ember over the other frameworks? Well, uh, the community. The community is awesome. We are filled with really smart, really fun, and just uh, truly talented people that are trying to do great things. Uh, it's thoughtfully constructed. Uh, you know, lots of effort and care has gone into creating it. And uh, it's been a huge collaborative effort. Uh, it's better and simpler than you think. Uh, a lot of the stuff uh, surrounding Ember and people's caution to say, oh, you know, I'm not ready to use that, has been, it's uh, too hard to learn, it's too steep a learning curve, and it's really not. Uh, so take a chance to look at it, and, uh, you know, I'll sort of tap into that later. Uh, it solves many problems with uh, tried and true principles of computer science. We've been doing computer science for a long time, and we've learned a lot of things, and we've forgotten a lot of things. But this sort of is uh, an archaeological restoration of uh, true computer science principles applied to the internet. Um, and great patterns for solving complex asynchronous behavior. This is a lot of what we're dealing with. We want, you know, Lots of uh, different APIs. We have constellations of web apps now. We have devices that are wearable. We have, you know, there's all sorts of stuff getting passed around with JavaScript and JSON as the language that 
connects all of these constellations of uh, applications, servers, people. Uh, so it's, it's complicated, but uh, it, this does a great job of attacking that. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to take a breath. So uh, server and web platform agnostic. Uh, I say that because uh, you, know, you have JavaScript on both ends, and uh, you know, we have lots of tools for using JavaScript uh, to sort of pass around uh, just hashes of, of uh, I guess, um, just data structures. Uh, we have Tom Dale, Yehuda, Katz, and the team at Tilda. Uh, they have obviously had a huge impact on the internet and technology that we use. They have been leaders in uh, creating the things that uh, are, you know, true things that everybody uses. jQuery, I think we already know this for the most part. Uh, Long-lived application state, that's a challenging thing uh, that Ember addresses. We have great library uh, implementations doing things that will blow your mind. Uh, we have real-time distributed data and analytics um, capabilities that are starting to develop. Uh, and we have an infectious positive outlook. I think that's presenting itself pretty clearly manifesting in my style of address. Uh, direct extension of Ruby community of tender loving. Uh, I think we all know that, um, well, many of you don't, but the Ruby community is uh, sort of directly pioneered by uh, people like um, uh, tender love. What's? Aaron Patterson. Aaron Patterson. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Really interesting and brilliant. Uh, so what are the uh, component pieces of code? Uh, very similar to all the stuff that's already been covered. Uh, I've put it into three buckets. Uh, a bucket that is stuff that we use that are really powerful and well built. Stuff that is just brilliant and uh, in its simplicity and power. And stuff that's still sort of a mess, uh, which is sort of some of the stuff that people point to and say, well, we're not going to use ever. <clears throat> so, uh, really powerful and well-built components. Uh, Ember's object system is fantastic and does extend uh, JavaScript objects, but it gives us really great uh, sort of functional style uh, things that we're, we're accustomed to in things like underscore. Uh, we have a great router and routes, which put um, you know the Ruby on Rails style uh, routing structure and puts URLs back into, uh, if URLs are a first class citizen. If, if you are changing application state uh, in Ember, you should be changing the uh, URL along with it. Oftentimes, you see stuff like in Google Maps, uh, or used to, uh, where you could copy the link and it wouldn't be really uh, something you could share with someone else. Uh, components. Um, everybody's got those, but Ember's doing a pretty good job. Uh, things that are absolutely genius. Uh, we have uh, Metal, which is sort of the very base uh, set of tools that everything in Ember is built on. We have an Ember Run Loop, which is an object, uh, or it's it's basically a way of synchronizing asynchronous things. Uh, and I'll get a little bit more into that. And RSVP, which is a uh, library that uh, Ember extends to sort of connect these two dots. And things that are kind of a mess. Oh, so. OK, what that should say is Ember data. <laughs> which uh, is sort of a mess. Uh, views, I think, are a thing that uh, should go away. I think, uh, I think that um, templates and components do a really great job and are super powerful things. There are a small set of use cases where views are useful. Um, 
And the other thing that I had on this slide, or was supposed to be on here, uh, was probably, well, I think Ember data is, is really the, the thing that needs to get uh, fixed up. And I, I think it will be shortly. Um, so what does the code look like? Uh, well, it looks very much like background. Uh, th this is uh, the prototype that we built uh, before we built the Open Research Exchange. We explored using Backbone, uh, and we ran into some issues. You know, it, I like it, but it wasn't the tool for us. So uh, this is what a router looks like, and it just is essentially a uh, you know hierarchical hierarchical uh, set of paths that describe uh, how different resources or uh, you know, the path to get to a certain set of resources, whether they are a collection of items that you, uh, you know, collection of enumerables that you're presenting an index page for, or whether you're uh, going to be just having a path nested within that. <clears throat> Very much like Ruby on Rails. Uh, and this is what a, um, a route looks like. So a route uses the, uh, the run loop, uh, which it, you can sort of imagine as a, uh, a circle running over time and buckets of things that uh, can happen uh, sequentially. And you, you should explore that on your own. But it helps some do asynchronous things. Um, and it has different hooks for uh, you know, tapping into when something should happen. So for example, in this uh, route world, uh, you know, the, you've defined this route. It's associated with a particular uh, resource, in this case, uh, Campaign model which you might have in your database uh, on your on your whatever server backend you're using, and uh, you you know have some uh, use something like Ember Data or your own uh, you know ORM extraction layer for, for uh, grabbing resources from AJAX calls. Uh, but once once you hit this route, it is associated with the uh, router that is matched up to it. So, if I go back a slide, it's not back. If I go back a slide, if uh, I think this said campaigns. So you'd have this resource campaigns, and if something in your URL matched slash campaigns, you would then trigger an event that uh, resolves this particular file and uh, grabs it. And these are hooks that happen in a particular order. So in this case, uh, I believe setup controller happens no, model first. Yeah. The perform model, model after model, and then the model expenses. So model has to be resolved for some controllers. Correct. So there are, a, you know, number of other event hooks that you can tap into. But these are some of the uh, basics. And you, this is what you'll typically find in, uh, in, a, in a route. So you would resolve the uh, model first, and it would use this. And this, this is using Ember data. And it's, uh, in this case, I'm creating a, a new record. I'm not, so this is a campaign's new route. So on the collection, this would be uh, dot .find. And uh, set of controller, uh, at this point, the app already has, when this hook gets caught, the uh, model has been resolved and can be passed in through a method here and uh, sets up the context. Uh, you don't have to use this. It, can, it will happen automatically with a default. But if you want to modify uh, what gets set up um, your, your context, your controller in, uh, in Ember is the context for your templates. So you have a model, you have a controller, and then um, 
you can you know set different uh, set those to different properties and uh, modify stuff that's coming out from your model. Render template will happen last and will use the model and the controller and it will uh, do some uh, dependency injection and uh, use use it to render your template. Five minutes? Got it. All right. So what does the code look like? Uh, this is a controller. It's a context. Uh, these are different properties that uh, you can set up either directly in here or in that set of controller hook. You have uh, different actions that can happen. Uh, in an action hash, those can be triggered. And so you have sort of this live context that can respond to different things for your template. And uh, this probably should be in there, although I'm not sure. I was doing some WebSocket stuff. Um, this is what a template would look like. Uh, this is a um, this is emblem, which is a indentation aware uh, version of handlebars. Um, so this this would just be your uh, HTML elements, you know, DL, DD. Um, and links, links would go to uh, stuff that are in the context. So anything that's you know character feeds, that's something that is available in the controller, uh, which is like I said, the context. <coughs> and then um, a promise is something like this, where you say uh, have your model available in your in your controller, uh, your context, and you can call save on it. And the save is something that happens asynchronously. You're saving to your server. Uh, and when you say then, you are making it so that this is a callback. So you you wait for this to resolve, and when it does, uh, the remember run loop picks it up on the next run, and you end up uh, being transitioned in this case to another page. And uh, what's the best path to learn more about Ember? Uh, I know a lot about this. So, uh, you know, Code Academy is a, a great tool that uh, has some stuff on it. Uh, go to various Ember conferences. We just had the first uh, Wikipedia Ember conference last week run by uh, Doc Yard and um, organized by um, Brian Carterella here. Uh, you can use the API documentation. It's uh, very good. Um, so it might not be always super up to date, but it, it is uh, great documentation. Uh, do a lightning talk or a brown bag at your company. That's how I got started. Um, try to build something with it. That was the next step I did. Uh, there's a great community on Discourse, which is a forum run by a company called Yap, which is built using uh, Ember. And you can uh, get involved with Brian at Dockyard. He is the hub of uh, the Ember world in Boston. Uh, Boston Software for Good Meetup is uh, a group that I started recently. And uh, there's the Boston Ember Meetup run by Brian at Dockyard. Uh, so all of those are wonderful places to go to uh, get involved and learn a little bit more about it. And uh, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Uh, that's that's my talk.
so that's using some node and npm to uh, get it set up. But uh, the documentation on it is really simple. If you want, uh, I can point you in the right direction. Uh, it doesn't take that much to get set up these days. Uh, and it's coming a little bit more uh, like stuff that you can just pull in piecemeal rather than use the whole frame. Okay. Yeah. All right. So our last talk of the evening is by James Risho. Uh, Risho, I love it. Uh, yeah. He's a product developer at Maxwell Health. Um, and he's got a, a number of frameworks. He's going to talk to us about React. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, James. Um, so, as Scott mentioned, I'm a product developer at Maxwell Health. Um, you know, we use Node and uh, right now we're using Backbone and React. So, uh, we'll talk a little bit about React. Um, uh, so, we're going to go over, you know, uh, you know what it is and it isn't. Um, you know, how you test using React, uh, how React actually works. Uh, it's a little bit different than the other frameworks that we've been talking about. Um, and you know, basically, you know, how you get started in React and how to build more complex applications. So uh, a little bit about React. Um, it's made by Facebook. It was released about a year ago. Um, you know, it, it was open source, you know, made in 2013. Um, the big thing here, you know, Facebook, I'm sure if you've developed applications for Facebook before, you're probably a little scared off. Um, you know, I can tell you that this is definitely in the right direction of what we want coming out of Facebook as far as uh, open source development. So first off, what React is not. Um, it's not a framework. Just like we were just talking about Ember, where it's a fully opinionated framework that you're going to be using to build applications. Um, you know, and it, has, it tells you exactly how to build those applications. It's not that. Um, it's also not a framework for building frameworks, like Backbone or Angular, where you have all the tool sets. You're going to go through, you know, you have a way, you have routers, you have all those things. Um, what React is, is the V in MVC. So it's only the UI. So what they're going to be doing is taking the, you know, the DOM generation that you're going to be doing, the, the actual HTML markup, taking that and merging with the display logic. Um, you build those complex UIs that you want to build using very good reusable components. Um, and you know, it's small, it's got support of Act IE. So how does your app work? Um, most people are going to see this. Uh, I'm assuming it's probably a little small to see. And freak out. Because that's this is React, right? This is uh, HTML markup inside your JavaScript. Um, <coughs> You know, they're mixed in. So what we would do, and this is how most people are going to do it, is then you use a JSX transformer. So you're creating these JSX files that have markup in them to turn it into this, which is full-on JavaScript. Um, I doubt that anyone's actually writing this full-on JavaScript that's going to be injecting code into your application. But you, know, you could do that if you want. So how does React work? Every single time you make a change, it's going to fully re-render the application maintain state. So what is it doing? It's not doing any kind of magical data binding or dirty model checking or you know, explicit DOM operations. It's actually using a, a virtual DOM to man, maintain a relationship between the application code and the stuff on the actual UI. So it's kind of weird because you're talking about something that's kind of sitting outside of your normal application. And it's kind of doing a depth of every single change. So you know the application says you know the DOM you know there's a change maybe you you know change a drop down box or something like that it sends a message to the virtual DOM to say hey there's a new change it's going to change you know the application logic is going to look for those changes and then send a dip down so now you're talking about you know that sounds kind of heavy right like you're going to be doing all this virtual DOM work um, so it doesn't work it does a dirty check to see oh you know the the DOM is doing the dipping. Um, it just with the old stuff you calculate some most minimal changes that it'll need to create a new beautiful UI, queues them up, and then batches the next piece. Um, so how did you get started with that? Like, that sounds really complicated. Um, and this is the most simple example of React, right? You're going to take this um, React example, and you're just going to use script tags included, include this JX transformer, inject hello world, and you just have this hello world thing. And, and Really, you know, all the, the work here is right here. It's 
surrender to the That's a really basic example. So let's look at something a little bit more complex. Um, here you're talking about a button that's going to increment a count every single time. Um, you can see some stuff that's going on here. So we're going to start with zero as the initial state. Every single time we click, we're going to up the count each time. And you can see there's this on click handler here that's going to uh, pass up this function that's going to you know, increment the count and update the state. So every single time the state changes, it's going to send out a message to say, hey, go and it. And it fully renders the page. So let's just look at that example. So here's the example, right? Very simple. <laughs> so you know, you can look at this and go, okay, that's great. I mean, how would I do more complex application? Um, so I don't know how many here use non Google Brunch or Gulp. Um, so for for us at Maxwell, we use Browserify and Gulp, um, and we use Browserify to do all the uh, JSX transformations. So the real key here is every single React component is going to be its own encapsulated piece of code that you can import using GitHub you know, Browser 5 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Could you uh, zoom? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Or, but no, I just mean like, uh, you know, control plus. You just remember that. Oh, sure. Better? Yeah. Uh, whoa, yeah. You mean zoom out and then control plus? Did you do one of these items? Yeah. yeah. Right. There you go. <laughs> so the big thing about React, because it has this you know, HTML markup inside of it, is how would you test it, right? There's, there's kind of dumb elements that are inside of it. Um, the difference here is Facebook actually kind of solved this with Jest. So Jest is a test runner that uses React's virtual DOM to do testing. Um, it's based on Jasmine. And it does automatic mocking. So you can say, you know, I'm gonna, you know, scrape for these large scale applications, you're gonna pull in a bunch of different tests, you know, you can implement that version required to do the work. So you're doing things like in the last slide, you can achieve coverage pretty quickly, um, go back, right? If you look at this class, you can keep reusing this clicking class, kind of how I did, where you're gonna be importing that kind of the same way that Angular has where you have this own your own markup. Um, you can keep reusing that. You just import it using the wire if you're using Drive to Five. Um, so if you're doing that correctly, you can keep testing, you know, just those little pieces. So it's easy to test the UI, kind of go through it. Um, you know, you can achieve code coverage pretty quickly. The best part is you don't actually have to keep using, you can just use Jest for further UI testing, or you don't necessarily need to even use React. Um, so if you were, you know, example of testing using React, or testing just in testing React uh, code, you kind of go through, there's this you know, button that we're going to be using, um, it has some unique stuff that you're going to be doing, you're going to increment each time, maybe you write a loop that says, you know, check to see how many times I clip through it. Um, it makes it really simple to test. So what do you want to do? You want to kind of put it all together, right? You want to have multiple reusable components, and each component is going to have its own logic tied to it. We're going to reuse them. We're going to have guest tests. We're going to have open browser fire. We're going to build large scale applications. We're not building, you know, you know, we want to build single page applications, but we want to build really large scale applications. Um, so, you know, as a silly example, right, there's these two of those now buttons that have their own logic. Um, and they're not affecting each other. Right? And all we're doing is just going to be including this one. We have this view list, you know, also included here. And they're all encapsulated in their own piece of logic. So, you know, you have the groceries, uh, the trash. You know, you can compute each one. So it's a very simple application, but it's you know has multiple components that aren't affecting each other because they're each you know pieces of code that you're turning in. There's very little requirements here because you're really just playing with the UI. There's no you know, anything like that. Um, so how can you start? You can start right now, right? This is a, you know, your, your, you know, in the browser with a super simple project. The first one I showed you, you could use a couple script tags and throw in a piece, and you, know, you can start working on it right now. 
Um, you have more advanced projects with multiple components like we just showed you. You go even further, right? Um, you have pre-rendered React using, uh, you know, serve from the server. So if you're using Node, you go include React on the server and print it out again. Um, lastly, this is the biggest difference. Probably, you know, React as far as being just a piece of something. Um, you can use it with backbone. Uh, there's a library or a couple libraries that use React with backbone. Um, you can go through, have different mixins, and you know, these mixins are great. You can kind of go and include backbone models to kind of change things up. If you're using backbone collections, you can change things up. So you know, React is a little bit different than maybe you know these other ones where if you have full applications, you can just drop this in as a backbone view. It's like a replacement for the backbone view. So if you guys are looking for more information, uh, you know, there's React docs, there's the Jest docs. You can type a little bit more information. Um, Pete Hunt, who's the you know on the Instagram and I think Instagram team, uh, had a great uh, project. But you know, talking about why they, they built React, um, and uh, Christopher Chadeau at uh, the developer room talking about how it works. Um, so if you guys want, I can show you how uh, you know, how this was built as far as using multiple uh, components. So. So when we talk about you know the different tasks, right? So if you look here, um, there's the larger container, right? Which can include each button. And like you said, or like I showed you guys before, there was you know a button that had you know the text not the chains and not chains. These are properties of that button, right? So if you go into each button class. You're going to see this dot, this dot cross name. Each of those are, you know, they're going to inherit the, the thing that you're instantiating that, that way. So in this case, you could actually have more complex stuff that comes in through that cross. In the case of uh, something I was just building today, uh, I included a background object, right? So now when I, you know, maybe click on a button or something like that, I can play around with this background object, make changes to it, click, you know, go through save. Um, you know, and that model will still be maintained using you know, this uh, props. Um, the state, you know, as I, I discussed before, it's going to update every single time. It's going to send this render function every single time. Um, if you see here, this task uh, has an on destroy function. Well, so that's just the property of the task now. Um, so every single time, you can just kind of give these properties to each of these objects and, uh, and kind of go through and, and have all sorts of different functions. And all this logic is encapsulated with this. So it's very easy to go and then have a task that would go and test just this object. It is just x file. Rather than, you know, I, I can tell you from back one, it can get messy if you're kind of you know, pulling in different things. You maybe have layouts. You have uh, you know, views with you know, models or something like that might be a little bit messy. So, yeah, it's good. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, you got separate components and they have their own state. What happens if you wanted one component to talk to another component or send another event? Is that possible? Yeah, so that's actually kind of what this is doing here. So, this on destroy, um, it has a function called you know, destroy this, right? But what the on destroy function is actually doing is, is destroying a task inside this larger task manager. So you're passing down a function from its parent, right? But it's, or the child is sending up a message to destroy itself, right? Um, you can go the other way too. You can do child up to parent, um, you know, and then you go up even more levels, right? And you go back down to maybe a different component. Um, and, a really complex UI, but you know, maybe a few different points are all over the place. Yeah. So, I'm a little confused. I, I haven't looked into React at all. So. But if I was using Backbone, what would cause me to go, hmm, I should go check out React and replace my views and go to, or, right. or maybe not replace, or maybe in conjunction with what? I don't, I'm not understanding what it so, enhances. 
So right now there's like a separation of concerns, right? When you have backbone, right? You're going to have templates and views, and those templates kind of are just there's no logic to them. They're just kind of out there. We end up kind of writing logic around it, and I know, especially with handlebars, I find myself writing little helpers all the time. Um, and really, what you're doing is separating those two things uh, quite a bit. What you could do instead is, is kind of tie more closely the template to the the actual view, the view logic. Um, and that's kind of what this solves. Is, is you know there are times that I can give you an example. Um, so our, our our system is pretty complex in that we have uh, multiple, you know, we'll say templates of objects that are, uh, you know, require their own pieces of logic. We're not going to build, you know, huge amounts of logic for each of those components. It could be hundreds and hundreds of, you know, unique things uh, built into one backlog view, you know, because they're getting served up by one thing. Instead, we're going to have, you know, pieces of React that can just kind of come in. They have, you know, they have their own little piece of code that we're going to reuse over and over again. Uh, so that kind of answers your question. Okay. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other way to do examples in the wild? Yeah, so yeah, Facebook and Instagram are both using it. Um, so I couldn't tell you exactly what they're using, but yeah, they're you know, pretty proud that they're using it in you know in the wild and, and going with it. Um, we are we at Maxwell Health are using it um, for our mobile application. And our uh, web application. Uh, so, yeah, so they're allowed as far as, yeah, that's well. Um, but yeah, the, uh, yeah, I mean, they're pretty proud of the fact that they're using it at scale yeah, sources. Thank you very much. No. Cases that I've seen a lot of different ones, but two primary ones for Angular. The first is 
Uh, if you have an existing application and you just want to have a framework that has more power and um, a lot of the features that I mentioned just for like smaller pieces, uh, I see people using Angular a lot just for like one page or one like little part. And then the other side is if, if you're just building a brand new application, uh, you know, a single page application that's really large, uh, I think Ember is very good for, good for that uh, too. Uh, but Angular, using a lot of the other tools in the community, you can build really complex uh, front end applications and full uh, single page applications as well. Uh, so I, I think that for Ember, uh, right now the best application uh, that is crying out for uh, the use of Ember is something that um, is sitting at the uh, heart of a large business that has scaled to the point where its monolith app is no longer tenable and uh, you know, it's having performance issues. And where the set of tools that you were building are mutually, um, so the apps that have a strict hierarchy where you have sort of a content management system where it's cyclical in nature. So an offering platform where you're delivering, you know, some, uh, some resource to one group that is using Ember and uh, then whatever gets fed back into that can be analyzed by another group of people. So in my particular case, uh, you know, we have an offering platform for researchers to uh, give clinical trial surveys that they have authored on our application and deliver them to our uh, large monolith eight-year-old uh, application that we've built to uh, get people to donate information about their health conditions so that researchers can analyze it. So it's, it's this you know, uh, large platform that is it's difficult to have in one app. So if you need to start scaling and uh, you know, really having a lot of pain points with different sources of data, um, then Ember is definitely the tool for you. Um, there are other libraries like 
underscore j underscore tennis, which actually let you do it because it's based on the ERB. Um, I think what it comes down to is, you know, there's a certain philosophy around these templates, and you should adhere to whatever you feel is most, most comfortable. Um, for me, it's missing as little logic into the template as possible. And if possible, you know, with handlebars, you can pre compile the template, you don't have to run eval on the uh, strings beforehand, and in that way, you get across a lot of security restrictions which are on the right now. Maps, for example, there's no real way to get the 
it's not like you're doing doing automatic updates within your code, right? Like you're not going to automatically upgrade to a new version once it comes out. I mean, that's where again it comes down to just testing. But what I would say is that with the at least up to this point with the versions that have come out, uh, I have had you know, a lot where a new version comes out and it breaks something. But it's always something that we detect it quickly because we have test markets in place and we kind of go through a process and we're kind of aware of that type of thing that can happen. So I, I don't think I've ever had any major issue where like the system comes down because you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, should, it, you approach it in a certain way because you recognize that. So is there any way to like specify a certain version or download? Yeah, yeah. So, so I. For sure, yeah, yeah. like uh, you know, in all your code, you're specifying very specific versions of uh, Angular that you're using, as well as your other dependencies. I mean, that's an important part of the build process. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So you can. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Just versus Google Maps, where it's more obscure to yeah. yeah. the versioning. So it, yeah. I think the, the level maturity of, of the apps to what what's different backbone version is that 1.1 1. 1. 1. Ember is that what? 1.6. What's Angular at? Uh, 1.2, 16 or something. So like all of them and React, is it React over 1? I think so. So, so generally, they're, they're all indicating that you can use this in production by, by having a number larger than 1. I think it's the sort of the general. How stable are they from a release to release level? That, that is always the question, right? Generally, these, unless they're doing a big version jump, so like Angular 2.0 is going to change stuff, right? And that's sort of, the, you, you accept that. Um, but, but all the frameworks are, you know, that we talked about are stable enough, and they're all versions so, um, uh, of. They've been Angular two. They've been kind of telegraphing that it's going to be changing for a while, right? And it's been for a while. What are we right now? Right. So, so there are a couple of things will change. So I, I think we got a little sidetracked on the specifics of the application that you're talking about. You you mentioned that you work for the government and they want auditing. Data. They want. Um, mainly, they, it just means that they use version control so you can easily reference like where we were at. So if you need to support legacy stuff, basically, you can do that. Whereas something like Google Maps, for example, you really just can't access the version. Right. So right. you don't know where you're at. So. so there are databases out there that have the power to uh, sort of let you rewind and. Uh, fast forward in time through uh, sort of databases and, and versions that you've, uh, you've done. Um, there's uh, Neo4j and uh, there's also, um, what, does anybody know what the one where, where you can like literally fast forward through your database? I don't know, but I don't think she's talking about it. We're talking about version control as far as the jobs are low, so something like NPM, the five gigabit solution that you have. Oh, yeah. It's just like the, the, the yeah, version. it's really simple. I just was wondering, how do you use Google Tensor Square to look at other right. applications? So I was curious how Angular put together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Angular more straightforward, like, we're on 2.0, we're on 1.0. Yeah, I, I think they all fit into that uh, okay. and, and have, have really good support for that. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm going to talk about Amber. When you start a new Amber application, do you know the kids on? Either using Ember Active or General Ember from the user version, or do you just go without any of I, I think that you have to make an informed decision there. It really depends on uh, you know, what what app you're using. But um, I, I definitely think that Ember App Kit is a great place to start for a Greenfield app. Um, and Mindin.js is probably a good tool for. Uh, excuse me, can you keep it down back there? Yeah, you were much better. All right, sorry. Um, I think the way forward building new Ember applications is me pushing a new tool called Ember CLI, which is actually built on top of what we've learned from Ember App Kit. For those that aren't familiar, Ember App Kit is extraction from the app. Uh, they have Ember Core Team developers on it. It has a Rails-like product structure to it. Uh, some of the key features of Ember CLI are going to be um, very fast asset compilation. Instead of using Grunt, uh, which was mentioned during one of the presentations, it's using a new asset compiler called Blackly. Uh, extremely fast, but also big on it is ES6 modules. 
So if you're not familiar with the ASIC module, this is going to be a, uh, it's a part of the new JavaScript stack. And I highly suggest that you look up on it. But if you're interested in building an Ember application today, don't even bother for the starter kit on emberjs.com. Go and look up Ember Steel Live. Is that released or is that still? It's 0 0.0.37. It's very, very alpha, but we've been using it for production applications. Yeah, I, I've used it recently and it's, it's definitely solid and really easy to use. All right, we probably should should wrap up. Um, we're going to get kicked out of here in just a couple minutes. Uh, so, you know, if, if you want to go around the corner or uh, hang out you know, down the lobby, you can continue some conversation. Otherwise,